we are here. Oh, <laughs> we are here today for our lunar meeting, and I'll be chairing today. Um, Chair Sarah Gus, I believe, is on Zoom. Um, so let's get going, and we will have our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. I think we must have some housekeeping before we go on. We do just a few housekeeping notes before we start the meeting. Uh, as you just heard, the meeting is being recorded and streamed over the internet. Uh, for members of the public viewing this meeting online, we accept and encourage public comment and have provided options that are listed at the top of this meeting agenda. For our staff and committee members attending in person today, SACOG has installed cameras in our boardrooms and you are on camera and visible to parties viewing this meeting online. You are sharing microphones. Please do not pick up or move the table mics in front of you. You can speak at a normal volume and the mics will transmit the audio through Zoom. Green means you are unmuted and red means you are muted. Please do not access Zoom through your laptop device if you're in person. There's no need for that. Uh, for our committee members participating online, thank you for joining us today. Please mute your devices when you are not speaking and use the raise hand feature in Zoom should you wish to comment. Thank you. Um, may we have roll call, please? Okay, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your presence. Uh, Director Bullhan. Here. Frost. Here. Gallardo. Here. Gore. Absent. Harris. Absent. Kennedy. Here. New. Here. West. Absent. Vice Chair Baines. Present. Vice Chair Saragossa. Present. And Chair Clark, Clark Kretz. Here. And we have a quorum. Great. Thank you. Um, and now, is there any public, uh, any public comment? Um, no public comments. Okay. Now is the time for us to prove the consent agenda. On Karamov, the president of Karamov profited off Russia. Pardon me. Did we have a motion? I think one of the members was just coming um, onto the audio. Oh, okay. So I moved to approve. Uh, Sarah Gissel will move. Thank you. Can we have a roll call, please? All right, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your vote. Uh, Bulahan? Yes. Frost? Aye. Gialdo? Aye. Gore? Absent? Harris? Um, well, I, forgive me, but I just now signed on, so I'm not even sure what we're voting on. <laughs> No problem. We are uh, right. voting on the consent agenda. Okay, uh, yes. Thank you. Kennedy? Aye. New? Aye. West? Uh, absent? Vice Chair Baines? Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Saragossa? I'm sorry, uh, Vice Chair Saragossa, can you please indicate your vote? I think you may have be having technical issues at this moment. We can't understand you. Um, we'll come back to you. Chair Clark Kratz? Yes. And Director Saragosa, I'm so sorry. Are you able to try one more time? I am, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, motion carries. Sorry, bad, bad internet. <laughs> no problem. No worries. We heard you, which is great. All right, now we're going to move right into our action items. And I will be turning this over to Garrett. Hi, Garrett. Hi, good afternoon. Nice to see you. I'm very excited to be here today. We have two items about the Green Means Go program. So this first item, as you mentioned, is an action item. And then the one that follows will be an information item. So we'll start with the action item. Yes. Are the remote members of the committee able to hear? I'm happy to speak louder and into the mic more. Looks like you got a thumbs up from uh, Director Gialdo and, and Director Frost. New, I think you're okay. Great. But no, great point. So yeah, the, the uh, action item before you today is uh, to approve a contract for technical assistance. And then this is really a unique opportunity we have at SACOG. We're partnering with the Urban Land Institute or ULI. There's an affiliate here in the six county region. There's also the national affiliate. So the partnership would be both the, the regional and the national affiliate of ULI. And, and the idea is the ability to bring some resources into our region, some national expertise to really think about green means go. And um, so we're really happy about the partnership. 
the, the background is they have what's called an advisory services panel through UOI. This is their, their marquee technical assistance. They will bring out these national experts to our region for a week in the fall, really rolling up their sleeves on two corridors. So two corridors throughout the region will get this technical assistance, but we very much hope that any of the recommendations and lessons learned will scale not only to our region, but UOI is actually very interested in, in the recommendations in the state and the nation as well. So that technical assistance in the fall culminates in, in a panel and culminates in, in their recommendations and a study. So um, the, the work is gonna be funded from a grant that SACOG received for Green Means Go. It's separate from the funding that we'll be talking about next item, separate from the 34 million in Green Means Go funding, this is a separate effort paid for by a separate source of revenue specific for technical assistance to ULI. We, we've coordinated with state, we've coordinated with ULI. We just need to have this committee and the board act on the contract so we can move forward with the, the technical assistance in the fall. So, so that's the background. Um, we were in the process of, of talking to uh, local jurisdictions on those corridors. The criteria we're looking at, because I said there's only two slots for this technical assistance, is of course it needs to be in a green zone. They need to show evidence of planning in the corridor. They need to be able to talk about what are the key barriers to infill in that corridor, talk about momentum, and then also commit to staff time. So we're in conversation with the corridor. We hope to court or with excuse me the jurisdictions. We hope to route back with ULI, our partner on this, and have those two corridors selected in the next few weeks, and that will allow us to move forward with the technical assistance that culminates in the fall. So happy to answer any questions on this action item for you this um, this afternoon. Thank you, Garrett. Um, does anybody have any questions for Garrett? And I noticed, I just wanted to say, it looks like it's $120,000. Correct. Okay. That would be SACOG's contribution. And then ULI would um, also be um, supporting this. And that 120,000 comes from a grant that SACOG received okay. from the state. Great. Any other board members have any questions? No. And is there any public comment? There is no public comment. Okay. All right, so this is an action item, and I guess we would really need a uh, motion at this point to move this item forward. I make a motion to uh, um, I go ahead with this. Okay. I will second. Okay. Harris. Perfect. May we have roll call, please? All right, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your vote. Uh, Director Bullahan? Aye. Frost? Aye. Gallardo? Aye. Gore, absent. Harris? Yes. Kennedy? Aye. New? Aye. West? Absent. Vice Chair Baines? Aye. Vice Chair Saragossa? Aye. And Chair Clark Kratz? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. And the next item is information. And we are still going to be hearing from Garrett. So you didn't have to move from the podium right. very far, <laughs> which is great. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. And so uh, this is the, the main item in the Green Means Go funding program. So the, the action you just took is on some technical assistance, which we hope will sort of institutionalize and build out Green Means Go as our new program throughout the region. But of course, one of the marquee efforts through the collective work through of the whole region is, is bringing in this new one-time $34 million to the region. So the 34 million Green Means Go funding program. So that's what we're talking about today. The board has already directed this 34 million towards Green Means Go, and they've tasked us as staff to develop what are called the program guidelines, which is really giving more detail to the program. So Green Means Go is about accelerating infill housing that also helps reduce vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions in what we are calling locally adopted green zones. So that's sort of the tagline, but then the guidelines give the detail and the structure and the criteria behind that, that objective. So we've been working very closely um, with our state partners on this and that these are funds coming from the state. So there are certain parameters that are put up on us. So that, um, we need to align with those. And we also need to align with the objectives that this board has laid out for Green Means Go. So they've been working very closely with our state partners. We've also been coordinating with uh, the local city and counties on our ideas and it's culminated in what are in front of you today, the draft guidelines. So this is draft. This will come back to this committee next month for action. We're using the month of May to get comments um, far and wide on our ideas to date. And, and we really sort of culminated in what we're thinking about Green Means Go to what you, you see on the screen of three categories. So overarching objective is to accelerate that infill housing in existing communities and infill communities in these green zones. And to get at that, we have these three categories that you see on the screen. The first is what we call the early activation category. And basically the idea behind this is flexibility. 
getting at these near-term wins in green zones that lead to more housing. But you also see that there's 3 million of the 34 million available. So it's a much smaller program. So it's early, it's flexible, but there is a smaller amount um, available. And it comes from a little bit of a different funding stream, but allows us to have that more flexibility in the activities that can be funded. So it can include up to site-specific activities within these green zones, activities that will lead to more housing development in those green zones. So that's the sort of the category A you see in the slide in the blue. Site-specific early, we'll, we'll note too that the deadline to actually use these funds is in 2023. So it's a very quick turnaround. So something we'll emphasize in the criteria is, is this a project that's ready to go? Is it deliverable? So that's category A. And you see categories B and C in the green and in the gold. These are meant to be not site specific, but more corridor wide. So more um, planning or infrastructure can help activate that green zone for future housing investment. So the second category B in green is planning. We recognize that these green zones throughout the region are in a, a continuum in their process. Some of them are ready for capital investment. Some of them are, are still figuring out you know, what, the, what is the vision for that corridor. So we wanna have the opportunity to fund some of that planning work to get those green zones ready for that capital investment. So there's some specific um, uses of those planning dollars that are called out in the guidelines. And so this will be the, the um, medium program. There'll be between five and 10 million in this category. And there's a little bit of a longer timeline. And then finally, the largest category is the gold. It's called the capital projects or capital program. And this will be funding that infrastructure investment that will help activate that corridor for more housing. Now, an important point to, to emphasize that we'll be stressing in our communications with um, stakeholders is this is non-transportation infrastructure. Of course, SACOG has its transportation funding round that we do every two years. And, and most of our coordination to date with our partners has been through that transportation funding. So we need to emphasize that this program is actually different. It's the first time for SACOG that we're having this non-transportation infrastructure. So this gold category, category C, would fund things like sewer, water, uh, uh, stormwater, utilities, and the dry utilities that you will need in those green zone corridors to, to have that new, um, excuse me, that new housing coming in. So those are the basic concepts for the green means go. And you see how the 34 million is split across those three categories. Like I said, we're, we're in the process of, of um, talking about these guidelines far and wide. We, we've had a webinar with the local jurisdictions. We've um, sent this out and we'll have, be having a webinar with the housing and developers community. And we're also um, convening what we call a community-based organization or CBO working group, all to get uh, comments on these guidelines. The guidelines are also up on our website. So we're asking for guidelines by um, May 20th so that we can come back to this committee in June for a recommendation on to, to adopt the final guidelines. Two other things to stress as we go about um, standing up this Green Means Go program. First is, as I mentioned, the awards need to be in what we're calling a green zone. So the cities and counties have for the last year, year and a half been adopting, um, locally nominating, adopting green zones in their own communities. Not every community yet in the SACOG region has adopted or nominated a green zone. So to be eligible for funding in this program, a community needs to have an adopted green zone, but there is through this process, the ability to either revise an existing green zone or to adopt a new one. But by the time applications are due in the fall, the community needs to have a green zone to participate in this, in this, um, in this program. And the second is we're, we're starting to, to ramp up what we're calling the pre-application consultation where we really uh, encourage the, the cities and counties who will be the, the lead applicants in this program to, to talk with us early and talk with us often about their ideas. Um, as, and now that we have the guidelines out, there's much more structure so they can be thinking through, oh, we have an idea for quarter X or quarter Y, how would it fit with this criteria that SACOG's thinking about in the program? And we think those ideas um, or those conversations far in advance of when they actually put the time together to put an application in bear a lot of fruit and that we can we can point out where we think the evaluation criteria align and where they may not and so we're really encouraging now the cities and counties to, to, to work with us we've already started to have some of those early conversations about what are their thoughts for green means go type projects and again have those conversations far in advance of when applications will be due later this year so that's where we're at with green means go again a lot of work's got into this um, we're excited about where we're at we're looking forward to what comments we may receive um, in this month of may and we'll come back to this committee in uh, June for action on, on the guidelines. And then what will follow from that is we'll be putting together the application material themselves and then the, the app call for projects, which is the term we use when we're accepting applications will be in the summer and fall. And we'll be coming back to this committee in fall and also into early 2023 with a staggered set of awards across those three categories. So the first set of recommendations this committee, category A will be in the fall. 
And then the second and third in the categories B and C will be into 2023 of, of our recommendations for those awards of those programs. So again, um, we're looking forward to the comments to receive from the stakeholders I listed out, but of course, if there's any direction or comments from this committee, we're, we're more than happy to hear them right now. Great, thank you. Um, does any of our board members have any questions for Garrett? Questions? I think it's great that um, you've already gone out and did, done webinars for the jurisdictions. And it's, I mean, kind of a good idea, I guess, for all of us to go back to our, each individual ones and make sure that if there's an opportunity out there that we get in touch and, and follow through with that and know it's a lot of work. And that is very fast. So you said the fall for the category A? Correct. Okay. And yep. then, wow. And then you'll be accepting... Um, nominations for jurisdictions that might not have put something in and you're, when is that also in the fall or? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go over the, the schedule in more detail too. So category A is the first one out the gate. So applications will also will be actually in August, in July into August. And it's 3 million, so it's the smallest category, but it is that quick turnaround. And one of the reasons has that quick turnaround is we're really excited about these near-term opportunities, right? To demonstrate Green Means Go, the other reason we need that quick turnaround is that these funds need to be spent by 2023 right. so that we really need to get those funds out the door into the projects. So that's category A. Uh, applications due in uh, August, so late summer. And then categories B and C, the rest of the program, applications will be due in the fall. And then awards, our recommendation to this committee will come in early 2023. And we were pushing that out a bit into the fall to hopefully, there's no way to completely avoid overlap with other funding programs. There's a lot of funding programs out there right now, but we think that fall is a little bit of a sweet spot with some of the other pro funding programs at the state and now the national federal level. So um, it's gonna be a busy year for your, your local staff and in, in, um, you know, applying to these grants. So we think the fall is a little bit of that sweet spot of um, for those, those larger categories, the B and the C to have applications due then. That pushes us up as staff right against the holidays. So then we'll come back to this committee in 2023 with our recommendation. Right. It's already May. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> a lot of work ahead of us. Thank exactly. you very much. Yeah. Um, again, any questions for the board? Is there any public comment? No public comment. Okay. Thank you very Thank much, you. Garrett. All right. And now we're going to go to committee reports. And I understand that we have some reports from members that have been to Cap to Cap. Is that right? Yeah, I was going to ask, James, if you're up for it, if you maybe want to kick us off with a little bit of a report out from the cap to cap visit and tour. And then I think we have two members here that were there. So any insights or things that you might want to be able to share with the rest of the committee would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I'd love to, I know we at least have Director Baines, Ricker Harris, who were there last Friday. <clears throat> um, as I put in my executive director update, I think, well, for, you know, I, for some of I, not many people were there five years ago. We actually did a very similar tour five years ago. And that first stop that we made, Director Baines and Harris, I think maybe you heard some people say, there was hardly anything there five years ago. So it was really nice to actually see so much of what had happened. Um, I mean, really what we were, we were looking at is, um, a lot of infill development, a lot of mixed use. Uh, one thing that got a lot of our photographs was a fire station with affordable housing above it. Um, um, bus rapid transit, uh, the power of having transit corridors, uh, whether it's bus corridors, rail corridors, and the influence on, 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 on development and density. And I would say too, I think um, one, one, one thing I really took away from this tour this time is the power of knowing what we want, having a plan, sticking to it, not settling for less, um, and the importance of um, a lot of the design pieces that we were in very, very, and even some of our non-tour uh, locations of, the, of Cap to Cap this, this last week in the District of Columbia, um, really impressive examples of very walkable suburban and urban infill and mixed use developments. Um, and frankly, I just don't think we have enough of that in our region. And I could easily see a lot more of that in our region. This was not, I think, overwhelming to many of our communities. I think it was inspiring. Uh, 
Excellent. Thank My you, turn? James. Yeah. Are you ready? You know, I'm ready. I, mean, I didn't have a, <laughs> quite a presentation. Yay. But um, no, it, it was an amazing tour, to say the least. Uh, we started off with the Potomac Yard, as um, Ms. Cordes mentioned, that was nothing a few years back. And to see what they've developed there, um, even just the mode of transportation, seeing, um, seeing the buses having their own lanes and then be able to kind of supersede um, traffic control lights and that type of stuff, just the, the flow and everything. But more importantly, just the, the mixed use and the opportunities, like he had mentioned the uh, affordable housing above a fire station, like who would have thought of something like that? And, or the bottom floors in that Alexandria um, neighborhood being a grocery store, the complete bottom floor. I mean, and so these people don't have to walk far. The, um, the park that they had available there, we were actually able to talk to, to um, some, some folks that were walking in the park with their kids and, and they referred to, to um, just leaving the communities that they were in for a bigger home or what they still felt was uh, more open space when they got outside for places for their you know, kids to, to um, play freely and, and um, near proximity to, um, to their work, but everything being walkable and um, most importantly, having all the shopping amenities right there within, um, you know, with the walking distance. Um, what, you know, they had a, a huge dog park right now that is going to actually be, be um, developed into the future for more um, housing. I think that um, one thing that they, <clears throat> that they did not kind of foresee was um, how we've been through this COVID thing. And so many people started working from home. I think they overbuilt their office space you know, but I mean, time will tell if they have to, you know, kind of rezone those, assess where, where the actual need is for those. But, um, but again, we, we, going from there, we went into to, um, Shirlington Village. Again, amazing to see how they used a, um, they built it based around a theater. They wanted to keep that theater, wanting to, a, a library, sorry, a library and adding some theater, um, you know, some of the black box type of things in there for that communal feel. Um, just the, again, bottom floor all being restaurants, everything being walkable, one-way traffic through it. And um, upstairs all being residential, going back to the mixed use. Um, then we went to the Pike. In the Pike, we saw kind of new versus old development. And, and again, that, it seemed like all those places had that same theme with the grocery store. And that was the same, um, I guess, national that's out there being on the bottom floor. And, and, um, and the, I, one of the most important things was where you could kind of see that um, the models, again, a uh, multi-model transportation around everywhere. And Pike, they were talking about they had the highest bike or highest riding share might be the nation, James, correct me if I'm wrong, like 17,000, um, the, no, sorry, the riding share for the, for the bus people that actually use the bus services, 17,000 um, riders from that community. And then I'm gonna leave some room here for, for um, Mr. Harris to, to talk, but, um, but I fell in love with the mosaic. We went to the development of a 26 acre piece that was acquired an old, um, I guess there was you know, an old development that was tore down that's completely been remodeled, the coolest, most contemporary kind of feel where you don't have to leave this community. Every amenity is there. It's like people are leaving the malls to rent in this facility, right? I mean, they had a, on the fourth floor of a building was a Target. For second and third were all parking. The bottom floor was all office space. They had, you know, hotels. They had, um, they had events that was over the, the information they gave us was probably old. It showed that they had over 150 events a year. Now they said it's over 200. They have farmer's markets twice a week in this, in, um, in like a park, in Central Park type of idea with a, a giant mega screen that they have movies in the park every Thursday, but then other ones, you know, depending on kind of what's what they want to showcase in the community, but um, over 1,200 apartments, I think 126 or so uh, townhomes. Again, every every shopping from from Bloomies, which is a smaller floor uh, floor plan, Bloomingdale's, 
to um, yeah, any type of clothing uh, store. Any, I mean, everything was there. Restaurants. Um, you know, they had a dog park. They had um, a tap room, a wine bar. You know, whiskey around it. You didn't need to leave that community. The only thing they did not have there was was a school. And I guess that's in the future plan. They don't know if it's going to be a, um, an elementary or junior high. But I noticed that they had even like a, that Kumans or whatever, like the tutoring facilities. But I mean, I just, the opportunities that I saw or this infill development was amazing. I'm just really glad to have been able to go on the tour. I want to thank James and you know everybody else that arranged it. The speakers were amazing, the elected officials and you know, county city employees and that that um, you know, both current and past members of office and their staffs that did an amazing, amazing job. And and it was uh, an eye opener for me to see what opportunities that we could bring back to to our communities. So I, I just want to say thank you for um, for inviting me on that tour. Thank you, Director Baines. I can see you had a really good time. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> it was <laughs> awesome. It was, it was great. It was a great report. How about it, you, it, Director Harris? Yeah, that was a is a wonderful. Um, let me see if I can turn my video on here. A wonderful um, experience, I tell you. And the the bottom line is like like Karen was saying the the mixed use in general and the different varieties of what that means to different jurisdictions of, of mixed use and what type of amenities they bring. I spoke with one gentleman when we were returning, uh, Mosaic, and he, they, have you ever heard of the company uh, Inc. that does like uh, t-shirts and, and whatnot? Um, apparently they're nationwide, but they, they have their headquarters right there in Mosaic. And then in the same breath, he said, well, that, that's the lifeblood of our lunch crowd. That keeps the uh, helps with the uh, the restaurants and whatnot that are there, along with the residents that they that they put in. With the not only mixed use but a variety of mixed use for different levels of uh, whether it's single folks or families or whatnot that are all right there. And like Carmen said, that you would you wouldn't even have to leave. And one thing I found interesting is that in that little complex there, they deliberately did not put in curbs in on the streets. You can, it's, it's like their cars are, and, and believe it or not, that actually even had, it had a calming, a traffic calming effect um, to keep more of a small town, like a, a community feel. And to walk into one building and have, uh, you can go to Target, you can grab some coffee, you can read a book, you can go to, to the eye doctor, you can do whatever, um, but you don't even have to, or, and you can go home <laughs> at the same time. And it was really, um, Really nice to see that, and I, and I concur. The boy, we can sure use a lot of it um, up here in, in, in Yuba City as well. You know, some of these things. I after after the experience there in Washington, Virginia, um, it hurts my eyes to see a big parking lot with a grocery store way in the back, and because it's so much so much opportunity to there to uh, kind of retool, hit the reset button on the old minds on ways of doing things, and the opportunity is right there. And I think people would really like it. And I think what well, James alluded to the fact, and, and I agree, is less of as far as takeaways. Well, after all these examples we saw, knowing what you want and sticking to it and, and not settling for less. And it's really um, kind of difficult to uh, perhaps it takes some courage to have a developer come to you and say, hey, we want to do this, this and this but we don't want to do it that way. We want to do it this way, this way, this way. And, and, and to turn that, turn them around. Say, no, thank you. Um, we, this is what we want for our community. And this is what we're going to do. And, you know, you can, you could potentially get some criticism for that, but I think it's important to, and so that would, would, would there, and it also takes um, patience because this stuff doesn't turn on a dime. And the, the, also the, the all important value of uh, engaging the community early asking them what they want and um, working with them uh, in front of the ball. And I think that would, I think that would be very important rather than uh, those of us in, in these positions to decide for them. It's so important to, to engage with them and have them be a part of it, it gets buy-in. And, um, and they really, the, we had a really good variety of locations and uh, 
clearly took a lot of work and effort and planning um, to uh, provide us that opportunity. And I, I'm really appreciative of that. So yeah, uh, bottom line, it was very successful, very eye-opening, um, a lot of lessons, learns and takeaways, and um, hopefully we'll get to see some shovels in the ground in, uh, in that way up around here. So thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Sounds like um, you had a, also a great opportunity in Cap to Cap, and we're, we're all yes. we're all great, greatly excited that you had that chance to go. Any other um, report outs from board members? I Harris, actually, Jill. Oh, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, please. Well, I'm so disappointed listening that I didn't get there in that time this year to do the tour because I know that was my favorite part from a couple years ago. It was just. Uh, so eye-opening. So thank you guys for the great report. I appreciate hearing it. Um, and I look forward to doing Salt Lake and hopefully we'll find something very similar. Sure. Go ahead, James. Did you have something you wanted to say? I just I just wanted to, um, I think Director Baines had, had thanked me, uh, but really the thanks goes to Mia Lopez and AJ Tendick who on your staff who put that whole tour together and our hosts are amazing hosts, Chris Zimmerman, former elected official, um, who just knows <laughs> he has all the battle scars over lots of those projects. Um, and I think was was one of the people who was sort of saying, you know, I mean, I, the, the first stop we were at this rail yards was, was going to be a football stadium at one point. And the transportation committee uh, had a discussion this morning about, you know, um, even for even for Chair Jennings, he might have said, sure, give me a, I love football, give me a football stadium. And and actually, uh, it was rejected, and they actually had to go through a couple of cycles of, of, of plans that just didn't come to fruition, or the developers weren't giving them what they wanted. So, um, but again, just a huge, huge shout out to uh, Mia Lopez, AJ Tendek, and they are, as Director Gallardo just mentioned, putting together a June 23rd, 24th Salt Lake City tour for the SACOG board. So if you missed it, if you missed DC, and uh, and you're intrigued by those kind of remarkable presentations, by the way, by Director James Harris. Um, join us in Salt Lake City. Great, thank you. Um, I actually have a report out. It, it's not land use uh, oriented, uh, but it is something that is super uh, important to my town of Loomis. Um, historically, years and years ago, um, we had a very high population of Japanese Americans that lived in our town and in towns that were close by us and in Placer County. And 2022 is um, the year that's marking the 80th anniversary of the Japanese internment. And our library is starting tonight, a series of events, a month of remembrance. And if you go on to our library, lumislibrary.org, it'll give you a list of, of the events that are happening. Uh, tonight, there's a presentation by a gentleman named David Unruh, and I'll make sure I have his book correct here. Um, and it's the Japan Towns of Placer County. It's a free lecture, um, but we are gonna take this entire month uh, to honor our very special historical uh, leaders of, of our town and our area, so. Thank you. All right. Anybody else have any other matters to bring? Okay, with that said, I guess it's time to adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye now. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jen.